Imagine being unknowingly subjected to a scientific experiment for four long decades, deprived of treatment and care. How would this betrayal impact your trust in the healthcare system? Prepare to be shocked. In this episode, I'll delve into the origins of the Tuskegee experiment, tracing its roots back to the tumultuous era of the Great Depression a period of immense economic hardship. I'll uncover the harrowing details of how hundreds of unsuspecting African-American men became unwitting subjects in a twisted scientific inquiry and the profound implications it had for the generations to come. But beyond the shadows of deceit, I'll also explore the lasting impact of this tragedy on the community and the complex web of fear, trauma, and resilience that it has woven into the fabric of our society. From the depths of trauma emerged a legacy of fear and mistrust, shaping attitudes towards healthcare and vaccination in ways that still resonate today. Join me as I confront the uncomfortable truths and explore pathways towards healing and trust building in the realm of public health. Welcome to our exploration of the Tuskegee experiments and their trauma on the black community. What sinister secrets lie hidden within the annals of history? This Tuskegee syphilis study a dark chapter in American medical research starts in the heart of Alabama. Amidst the economic turmoil of the Great Depression, the United States was gripped by a silent epidemic, syphilis. Syphilis, as you know, is a disease contracted by infection during sexual intercourse, and it causes severe damage to the human body. In 1932, the U.S. Public Health Service, in collaboration with the Tuskegee Institute, launched an ambitious study to understand the natural progression of this devastating disease. Little did the participants know they were about to become unwitting pawns in a chilling experiment. Let's trace back to the events that led to this initiation. In 1929, the USPHS conducted studies in the rural South under a grant from the Julius Rosenwald Fund to ascertain the prevalence of syphilis among blacks and investigate the possibilities for mass treatment. Macon County, Alabama, home to the town of Tuskegee, emerged with the highest syphilis prevalence among the six counties studied. It was upon this conclusion that the Tuskegee study was conceived. The researchers banked on the assumption that most blacks in the town would not seek treatment throughout their lives. This assumption became a self-fulfilling prophecy when the study's researchers ensured that the participants received no treatment for the disease. It's crucial to note that untreated syphilis can lead to heart diseases, insanity, and premature death, knowledge widely known among the medical community at the time. This underscores the researchers' awareness of the consequences of denying treatment to participants and their decision to proceed regardless. Led by Dr. Talia Farrow Clark, a public health service officer, and Dr. Eugene Dibble, head of John Andrew Hospital. The Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male was conducted by the United States Public Health Services. Its aim was to observe the long-term effects of untreated syphilis in African-American men, comprising 600 participants, 399 with untreated syphilis, and 201 uninfected controls. Participants were promised treatment for bad blood, a colloquial term for syphilis, in exchange for their participation in the study, a condition pivotal to their agreement. In Tuskegee, a poverty-stricken town further crippled by economic collapse, the prospect of receiving free medical care was a significant incentive for participants. However, they were unaware that they would receive no treatment at all, as the study's sole purpose was to observe untreated syphilis. But the true horrors of this study are yet to be revealed. So stay tuned to uncover the full extent of its atrocities. The Tuskegee syphilis study involved blood tests, x-rays, spinal taps, and autopsies, all without their informed consent. In the initial phases of the study, researchers faced challenges in recruiting participants due to the fears that the physical examinations were actually for military recruitment. To address this issue, they devised a plan to dispel the notion. Women and children were also examined, and men diagnosed with syphilis who met the eligibility criteria were recruited. These men were provided with ineffective medicines under the guise of treatment, while others received proper treatments for their syphilis. This deceptive practice raised the study's expenses, but the researchers deemed it necessary for the study to continue. The fact that the participants jumped at the opportunity of medical care proved the foundation of the study wrong, i.e., black men do not seek medical treatment. 
However, despite the assumption being wrong that black men were unlikely to seek treatment, the USPHS decided to continue the study long term in 1933. Participants were enticed by the opportunity for treatment, although it was ultimately denied to them. From 201 controlled patients recruited, those who got infected during the study were switched to the syphilis positive group, which was a major breach of the study protocols. Notably, this decision was made during the era of depression, and the USPHS opted to allocate funds to a study with a shaky foundation, instead of addressing the pressing needs of the participants. This disregard for the participants' well-being reduced them to nothing more than guinea pigs for the sake of scientific curiosity. To keep the participants engaged, incentives beyond free medical care were provided, including transportation and free hot meals on examination days. These incentives were particularly enticing for the participants who were mostly cotton scrapers struggling to make ends meet. In one of the final stages of the study, Spinal taps were conducted to examine the evidence of neurosyphilis, a serious form of syphilis that hits the central nervous system. This procedure was not only invasive, but was also considerably painful. The participants could refuse to participate in the procedure. Dr. Raymond Von Delaire, on-site director of the study, realized this and wrote to his collaborators, details of the puncture techniques should be kept from them as far as possible to convince the participants to cooperate. He told them this was a special therapy, free spinal shots. The subjects believed that their lumbar punctures were therapeutic. Yeah, sign me up. During the course of the study, many participants became severely ill. It was difficult to convince them to come to the hospital. The USPHS incentivized them by promising to cover their burial expenses. You're kidding, right? The final stage of the experience was autopsies. They were crucial to scientifically confirm the study's findings, but wouldn't have been well received by the subjects. Dr. Oliver Wegner, one of the investigators in the study, wrote to Dr. Von der Leer, if the colored population become aware that accepting free hospital care means a post-mortem, every darkie will leave Macon County. Once again, the researchers wove a web of deceptions to perpetuate their unethical study. The subjects, trusting the USPHS, were manipulated into believing director of the Tuskegee Institute Hospital had been given an interim appointment to the Public Health Service. As Wegner stated, when these colored folks are told that Dr. Dibble is now a government doctor too, they will have more confidence. This was yet another layer of deception in a series of manipulations. The study persisted for decades. Its horrific details concealed from the public eye. It wasn't until whistleblower Peter Buxton, a former employee of the U.S. Public Health Service, stepped forward that the truth began to emerge. In 1966, Buxton filed an official protest on ethical grounds with the Services Division of Venereal Diseases, only to have it rejected on the grounds that the experiment was ongoing. Undeterred, he filed another protest in 1968, but his concerns were dismissed as irrelevant. It wasn't until 1972 that Buxton decided to take matters into his own hands. He leaked information about the experiment to the media, and on July 25, 1972, the news broke, sending shockwaves through the American medical community and sparking a public uproar. Three months later, the study was finally terminated. In the aftermath of the scandal, a class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of the subjects and their families, resulting in a $10 million out-of-court settlement. President Clinton issued a formal apology for the study, acknowledging the egregious violations of ethics and the harm inflicted upon the participants and their families. While the Tuskegee syphilis study created an outcry and shocked the nation, there were voices that attempted to rationalize the incident. You gotta be kidding me. Despite the mounting evidence of ethical misconduct and medical exploitation, some individuals sought to justify the study's continuation perpetuating harmful narratives that minimized the suffering of the victims and the severity of the ethical violations committed. The major argument, attempting to rationalize the experiment, was that it was aimed at providing the significance of treatment of syphilis in black men. So, it was meant to help the black community, ultimately. What do you think of this approach? Should ethical considerations take a backseat to the greater good? Or should they be at the forefront of scientific experiments? Moreover, were the USPHS, or more specifically, the architects of the study, responsible for the tragedy they brought upon their fellow beings? Or were they simply adhering to the norms of the time, unaware of today's ethical standards and legal considerations? 
Let's explore this question further to understand the context. How would you react if you found out that your health was the subject of a secret experiment? Would you be able to rationalize the motives behind it or accept the explanations provided by those who orchestrated the study? Some people argue that the researchers lacked malicious intent in conducting the study. They viewed it as their duty to conduct research, guided by ethical standards that were not as stringent as those of today. Consequently, they argue, it's unfair to judge the organizers by contemporary ethical norms. Additionally, proponents of the case point out the involvement of black healthcare professionals at all stages of the study. Moreover, according to Robert M. White, who conducted a detailed analysis of the Tuskegee study published in the Archives of Internal Medicine, the USPHS officers aim to forever dispel the rather general belief that syphilis is a disease of small consequence to the Negro. I believe it's akin to a firefighter standing by and watching a house burn, while others defend his actions by arguing it was for the greater good, reasoning that allowing the fire to consume the house would serve as a warning to the neighborhood houses about the dangers of fire. While the study was undoubtedly problematic from an ethical standpoint, the question of whether it was inherently racist remains debatable. But are these points valid? First, let's confront the most egregious aspect of the study, the denial of treatment to syphilic individuals. Despite being aware of the debilitating effects of syphilis, the investigators callously chose to withhold treatment from the infected subjects. In 1950, Dr. Wegner acknowledged we now know where we could only surmise before that we have contributed to their ailments and shortened their lives. Furthermore, the USPHS actively prevented the subjects from receiving treatment from other sources. In 1934, local black doctors were approached for their cooperation in treating the men listed in the study. The USPHS advised the Alabama Health Department against treating the subjects when they initiated a mobile VD unit in Tuskegee. In 1941, the Army instructed new drafts to commence an anti-syphilic treatment. The service provided the board with a list of test subjects to exclude from treatment, and the board complied. Despite the widespread availability of penicillin in the 1940s, it was never offered to test subjects throughout the study, even when it became readily available. However, despite these efforts, almost 30% of the participants who had received some penicillin on their own by 1952 primarily for the treatment of other diseases. Herman Shaw, a cotton farmer in Tuskegee, was 30 years old when he encountered a flyer offering free medical care by the US government. Shaw eagerly seized the opportunity stating, every year they would give us a full examination and a free meal. He told the Baltimore Sun in 1997, the thing that disturbs me now is that they found a cure. They found penicillin and they never gave it to us. It vexed me awfully, sadly. A 1955 report discussed whether the treatment received by some of the men had defeated the article argued that the relatively low exposure to penicillin in the age of antibiotics appeared to be due to the stoicism of these men as a group. It stated that these men regarded hospitals and medicines with suspicion. However, it failed to acknowledge that these men believed that they were already receiving treatment from the government doctors and thus saw no need to seek treatment elsewhere. The report concluded that the treatment subjects had received on their own was insufficient to compromise the experiment. The service continued to rationalize the unethical aspects of the experiment. In 1965 at the Center for Disease Control, the racial issue was briefly mentioned. It was concluded that it would not affect the study and any questions could be handled by stating that these people were at the point where therapy would no longer help them. It was argued that they were receiving better medical care than they would under any other circumstance. This argument has been repeated by many people since. However, this is not the case, according to Dr. Vernal Cave, Director Bureau VD Control, New York City Health Department. Three, Dr. John F. Mahoney uh, stalled the medical world by announcing that just a little bit of penicillin given over an eight-day period would cure early syphilis. Well, one does not have to uh, know this for very long without knowing that once penicillin is widely available, that we must use it in the treatment of all stages of syphilis. Well, by 1946, penicillin was widely available and the, the cost of it had been uh, markedly reduced. And treatment schedules were put out by the United States Public Health Service dealing with all stages of syphilis. And they have uh, 
modify those treatment schedules over the years. And they have been recommending and pushing for the treatment of uh, syphilis at all stages. As for the claim of black persons involvement in the study, evidence suggests that many blacks assisting the USPHS physicians weren't aware of the deceptions of the experiment. Dr. Joshua Williams, an intern in 1932, assisted Von der Leer in taking blood samples of the subjects. I know we thought it was merely a service group organized to help the people in the area. We didn't know it was a research project at all at the time. Similarly, black nurse Eunice Rivers, who was also a part of the study throughout four decades, didn't fully understand the experiment's dangers. Even in an era where formalized rules of human experimentation were not codified, the basic principles of humanity were universally understood. To deny treatment for a debilitating disease like syphilis, with its severe and far-reaching complications when left untreated, cannot be brushed aside or rationalized. However, it's important to recognize that assigning blame solely to individuals involved overlooks the broader context of scientific racism that permeated the medical community at the time and continues to leave its mark today. This is akin to going to the doctor for help, but instead being used in an experiment without your knowledge. It highlights how deeply trust was breached and why many people still harbor distrust towards the medical research and treatments. Many medical experts of that era now acknowledge that the Tuskegee study should have been terminated once penicillin treatment became widely available. Originally intended to assess the impact of syphilis on black men, the study's continuation in the post-World War II era, marked by the widespread availability of penicillin, raises serious ethical concerns that should have prompted its cessation. There were 74 survivors of this study, and they couldn't be treated after the program. The USPHS claimed that they were provided proper medical care and assistance otherwise. Do you think it was enough to absolve them of the injustice they inflicted on these people? I feel that it's the least they could have done after what they'd committed. It's the bare minimum. There was a point when those men could have been treated with some effectiveness. The fact that they weren't treated when they could have been easily done so remains the most critical moral issue. Even if the concerns about the pre-war era are put aside, the Tuskegee study shows us how seeking science can sometimes forget about doing what's right. But what happens when the pursuit of knowledge descends into unimaginable darkness? What hidden truths lie within the volumes of history? waiting to be uncovered. Join me as I shine a light on this dark chapter in history and prepare to explore the revelations awaiting us in Japan's Unit 731. As the echoes of betrayal reverberate through history, another chapter of inhumanity emerges from the shadows. Explore the chilling atrocities committed by Japan's Unit 731, a tale of horror and cruelty that resonates with the dark legacy of the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. While the Tuskegee Syphilis Study unfolded in the heart of Alabama, across the ocean in China, a different form of cruelty was taking shape. As World War II raged on, Japan's Imperial Army unleashed a reign of terror in occupied territories, with Unit 731 at the forefront of its heinous activities. Established in 1936 within the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo, Unit 731 operated under the leadership of the notorious microbiologist Shiro Ishii. Like the Tuskegee study, it was cloaked in secrecy masquerading as a research and public health organization while concealing its true agenda of human experimentation. The unit regularly subjected individuals to inhumane experimentation, degrading them to the point of internal reference as mere logs. These experiments encompassed a range of atrocities, from deliberate disease injections and controlled dehydration to testing biological weapons, subjecting individuals to hyperbaric pressure chamber trials, vivisection, organ extraction, amputation, and standard weapons testing. What does this tell us about the human psyche? Once we designate a group as other, it's enough to surpass our humanity. Geography, ethnicity, or race do not play a role here. It's the dark side of human beings that needs to be dealt with. The legacy of Unit 731, like that of the Tuskegee study, is one of enduring trauma and suffering. For the survivors and their descendants, the scars of their ordeal remind us of the depths of human depravity and the consequences of unchecked power. As we reflect on the harrowing tales of Unit 731 and the Tuskegee syphilis study, we are confronted with the deep scars left by past atrocities. But what happens when the shadows of history continue to shape our present reality? 
Now we turn our gaze towards the enduring legacy of the Tuskegee experiment and its profound impact on vaccine hesitancy within the black community. How has a historical experiment led to the enduring mistrust in the medical community among black Americans? As the wounds of the Tuskegee syphilis study continue to fester, its toxic legacy has seeped into the fabric of the black community's consciousness. For many, the betrayal of trust by medical authorities has left an indelible mark, fueling a deep-seated fear and skepticism towards towards vaccines and medical interventions. Moreover, black people are largely hesitant to participate in clinical trials. However, this is proving to be more harmful as these trials are aimed at adding diversity into treatments. Unwillingness to participate in trials means no dedicated treatment for the black communities. This problem stems partly from the Tuskegee experience and partly from general scientific racism against a backdrop where unfairness is deeply rooted in society systems, including healthcare. The Tuskegee syphilis study stands out as a grave betrayal. Those who were supposed to protect and heal instead misled and harmed, making the already wide gap in who can get good healthcare even wider. This study showed how deep the mistrust can go when the very people you're supposed to trust with your health use it against you for what they call research. As I bring our exploration of the Tuskegee experiments to a close, we're left grappling with the weight of history and the enduring legacy of betrayal and mistrust. Yet amidst the shadows of trauma, there also exists a glimmer of hope, a beacon of resilience and strength that continues to guide us forward. However, the power of communities to heal and grow despite historical injustices shouldn't be underestimated as we confront the painful truths of the past. We're called to action to dismantle the systems of oppression and inequality that perpetuate injustice and build a future rooted in equity, compassion, and healing. But remember, healing is something that we do together. Despite the shadows of historical injustices, communities have shown remarkable resilience and the capacity to heal and grow, forging pathways forward to a brighter future. Through collective action and solidarity, individuals have come together to confront the legacies of oppression and discrimination, paving the way for positive change and transformation. Healing requires us to listen, to learn, and to confront uncomfortable truths with courage and compassion. It calls upon us to build bridges of understanding and empathy, to stand in solidarity with those who have been marginalized, and to work towards a future where justice and equality are not just ideals, but lived realities for all. In reflecting on the profound impact of the Tuskegee syphilis study, we, we are reminded that the power of storytelling to educate the masses and bring to the forefront the voices of those who have been marginalized and silenced. In closing, let us carry forward the lessons learned from these experiments. The importance of trust, transparency, and accountability in healthcare, the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity, and the power of storytelling to shine a light on the darkest corners of our history. Together, let's strive to build a future rooted in justice, equity, and healing for generations to come.